coin gun, AKA Jeff Smith. I love that that's something that's normal to say in Dash that you can call someone by their web handle and then be like, oh, they're also known as Jeff Smith. Which would probably be funny because Jeff Smith could probably be a handle as well. Sure, and sure. Often I'm trying out like, a, I'll go to a documentation site and it'll be like, uh, for example, put in your name, Jeffrey uh, Smith. And I'm like, oh, well, that's awkward because that is <laughs> my, my name. And that is my name. <laughs> the example, I guess. I don't even know what's going on. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it is funny. And, and then there's people inside of Dash that all I know them as is their handle. Like Eudigen. I've Is Eudigen, is that his name? I don't know. Yeah. Know. Yeah. But he's a well, brilliant master. Indeed, he is. And speaking of masterful skills or what it is that people do in Dash, um, please tell us what what okay so i i asked you what is your title what is it that you do you told me network operations you said i do network operations with moo cow moo speaking yeah. of another handle and you can probably guess about me jeff that i don't really know what that entails much much less the details of it so what are network operations in dash absolutely uh you know i think the the first thing i'd like to start with is because it's a pretty it's a pretty subtle thing that we do, but um, we're involved in onboarding of all the new developers, uh, setting up the development and testing environments, and then the staging environments. So when we hear about Dash growing and we hear about Dash adding new users and adding new new employees, um, that's a direct thing that's involved in network operations. So we're setting them up with their email, giving them their access that they need to our different systems. Um, for example, Snogsel recently, you know, needed a couple of servers spun up. He needed access to testnet and mainnet. Uh, and so that's something that, that would fall on the network operations team. So it's sort of like that in between section between the developers and the business management team, and then the network infrastructure that Dash actually handles. So we're getting those developers and getting those people, the resources that they need or handing them off to the developers. So. Okay, so then you help new employees get access both to things that are that are the network itself, such as testnet or whatever, but then also things that are uh, specific to just like the Dash core team, like for example, the the email servers that handle Dash.org email and various like Dash.org core team specific stuff. Yeah, so you could think of it like. I mean, I call it infrastructure, but it's got lots of different names. It's not overly physical anymore. It's a lot of cloud-based VPS services, very similar to what you'd run a masternode remote end on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have we have 30 or 40 different uh, VPS instances that vary in range from a couple of gigs to 30 gigs or so. And, and those are the systems that support the public facing Dash infrastructure. So when you go to our website it, and it responds, when you hit our form and it responds, uh, different things like that. When you look up dash.org and you get a response from our, our DNS infrastructure. So it's, it's all those sort of the basic things that you need to be on the internet. So you need a domain, you need web services, domain name services, and all these different things. We're keeping all of that stuff working behind the scenes most of the time. <laughs> and so that everybody has this great experience. Um, but what I find can be a little bit unique about the situation is that it's a very publicly facing issue when anything goes wrong. So as soon as the site goes, goes down, everybody knows about that. And everybody is concerned about that. And everybody wants you to do something about that right away. And so I think that's the biggest thing that takes uh, a little bit of learning in network operations is dealing with that stress that, that this has to be done right now, drop everything you're doing, get it fixed. This is so important. And, and not everybody can deal with that type of stress. So how did you come to be doing network operations for Dash? How did that come about and when? Yeah. So I've been involved pretty early. I was about April 2014. So just missed just after the fast mine um, had sort of probably had seen some of that 
through the forums and stuff like that. And that was kind of why I had, had started reading about, you know, at that time it was dark point. Um, I originally got started to a side a little bit in mining. I was a big miner. I actually mined, um, Bitcoin on GPUs and then did, you know, got one of the first Bitcoin ASICs, these little, uh, some people haven't even seen these. This is like the very first little ASIC chip that ever came out for Bitcoin. I think I paid like one Bitcoin per stick. <laughs> yeah. And I think I had like 22 of them or something. So it was like 22 Bitcoins at that time. Ridiculous. Wow. A hundred dollar Bitcoin. And so, you know, I mined some, some SHA on GPUs and then I mined some SHA with ASICs. And then I got into Litecoin mining. You know, what's up Litecoin? Love you still. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then I just, it was just like, okay, well, what's going on really? Like the market, you know, that was sort of right at the bubble, you know, you had like the big Litecoin went to 50, Bitcoin went to 1150 or something. And it was just like, wow, this is crazy. And then, you know, the altcoin started kind of mixing it up. And I just, I was just curious. I was looking for the new thing to mine or the next thing to mine. And, and, and X11, its efficiency is just amazing. So I went from like running all these uh, Litecoin miners with like tons and tons of power to being able to switch over to X11 and using like literally a quarter of the power or half the power. And I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of interesting. Someone put the time to thinking about how to do this more efficiently. And, and, you know, then I got more involved with, it was IRC at that time. There wasn't really a slack and, and stuff like that. It was still, everybody did IRC. Um, and, and then I was like, oh, so I can mine X11. And then I was like, what about these master nodes? So that's kind of like mining, like the reward is a, is a mined coin, but I don't have to like put up with all the loud noises and all the video cards and all the wife grumblings. And you know, I'm, up, <laughs> I'm up in Canada. I think I actually heated my house for one winter with <laughs> miners, like literally it was like minus 10 or 15 outside. And my house is warm because these miners in the basement are just like heating the whole place. Um, and, and yeah, so it was really mining that brought me in and I, being an infrastructure guy already, you know, I ran data centers, I did a lot of different stuff like that. And, and it just was natural to kind of go from big servers humming to big miners humming. And it, it kind of gave me that geeky, you know, that most miners will understand that, that just that geeky kind of feeling deep down inside. You're like, wow, this is cool. Like these computers in front of me are doing right now like actually being used. And I think a lot of computers, they sit, you know, like if you look at like the life cycle of even your laptop or your desktop, like how often is it actually running at full capacity and doing something fully doing something like I'd say like 10, 30% of the time that it's actually like doing it. And so for us networking guys to see these computers just like going crazy and they're actually giving out like you know, results and it's all valid, that, that really gets, gets me going, you know, it's kind of geeky, but, uh, I can tell you have the feels right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's just, you know, this whole trip, this whole, uh, this whole last, well, last three months since Miami has just been crazy. Um, but yeah, anyway, I, I digressed a little bit there. So I, 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 you know, mining brought me in, uh, I started in dash around April, 2014. I wasn't an official, uh, core team member till about September, maybe October was my first my first actual team payment. Uh, and, and that was so, you know, that was just a, really just a, a natural progression. Uh, since the start, I'd always been in touch with Mucal. He'd been like, he always does just is so willing to train people. He's so willing to put his time into just teaching. And so he was teaching me for a while. And then, and then I was sort of asking him more questions. And then, you know, I would see sort of a hole where, maybe the core team hadn't spun up a specific type of service or something. And I said, Oh, you know what? I'll just spin that up. So, you know, I have some services running under masternode.io just to sort of fill the gap, you know, similar to dash ninja or dash vote mm -hmm. tracker community led services, um, you know, paid for by the community run on community equipment, but, you know, ha give a very, very important uh, or do a very important job for the network. And so then it was just a natural transgression where I started or I stopped turning up my own services and I started, you know, turning up services for Dash. So, you know, I rebuilt the Electrum servers, uh, put away my old Electrum server, built some other ones for Dash. And, 
and then it was just sort of starting to to come involved you know wherever i can uh the network operations team really grew from you know i was talking to mucal about this before the interview and i was just like you know how did that transition go and uh my understanding of it and forgive me if i get any of this wrong you guys i've kind of translated it through a few different things but you know it was basically evan evan the one-man show he set everything up he did all the coding you know everything and then Evan got involved, I think it was Flair that came on and Fernando. And so some of those jobs were taken over by those guys. And then eventually Flair and Fernando were busy. So that was passed on to Mucal. Uh, and then now, you know, mucal has gone through and passed it on to me uh, or is starting to pass things on to me. And um, what it really shows is just that we're growing and expanding and, and the scope and the demands of this project are just getting bigger. And so, um, you know, we had to make sure that there was some redundancy. And so Mucal's built in sort of a, a, a treasure back login system for the three core uh, network operations guys. So myself, Mucal and Flair. And so we're geographically spread out West Coast, East Coast of North America, and then out in Germany. And so that works pretty well for the time zones. You know, Flair can be online when uh, I'm not and Mucal's online before I am and I'm online slightly after. Well, I want to say slightly after him, but I don't think the guy ever sleeps. Like I, <laughs> he's often messaged me at four in the morning, his time, which is like seven in the morning, me, it's just like, or whatever the other way around. It's just like, what are you doing? Like go to bed, man. Like, and I don't know the guy, the guy's insane in a good way, in a very, very enjoyable way. Um, it's fun to, it's fun to be a cook in his kitchen and, and, and he, he's just has such a neat take on infrastructure like you know a lot of people i think when we had this price rise would have just started spending you know buying crazy servers and all this stuff and let's just throw all the you know resources at it and and mucal's you know he he described it really neat i'm going to quote him and he says it's like cooking it's like it's easy to add it's really hard to take away and so we use that same approach with our infrastructure is that we we like to add subtle easy small bits at first see how they work and then grow them or add to them um, when needed. And what that allows us to do is keep our budget low, um, but still be prepared for things that we, you know, we could come across uh, such as a DDoS or things like that. Um, you so know, I'm glad you bring that up. Uh, I would be interested to hear of what was the experience of the DDoS like for you? And if I'm not much mistaken, I think, did you mention that you had written the report uh, about the DDoS, like the wrap up report? Um, I, I don't want to say I wrote the report. I mean, I definitely spearheaded getting it out. Um, one thing that happened recently was the cloud bleed um, bug from Cloudflare. And oh, I remember hearing about that. OK, I would yeah, like to so hear that about week, that was a few weeks ago. Right. And and after that, Cloudflare released a really, really comprehensive, uh, basically a, a report saying this is what happened. This is what we did. Uh, this is how we have learned. And this is where we're going from here. And now, quickly to clarify, do would any master nodes be using Cloudflare or would this just have affected like the dash.org website? Yeah, this is more like Cloudflare is a service that that sort of proxies traffic. So this would have more affected sites like BTCE exchanges. So more of the, the infrastructure, like core infrastructure rather than like the masternode network is kind of weird because it is our infrastructure, but we don't really run it. All the community members run it, right? Like, so, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll loop back to this, but that's why when it was getting DDoSed, there's not a lot you can do. It's not like it's 4,000 servers that Mucow and I have shell on and we can just quickly deploy some sort of traffic read. It, that doesn't happen. Uh, so for us, what, what it was, was, you know, trying to, how can we help? How can we give these people the tools they need? Um, but, but just to jump back. So, you know, Cloudflare put out this report and, and it's just world-class, you know, it, it shows why they are in the spot that they are. And, and when Mukau and I were talking about it and reading it, you know, I, I had said to him, I would really like us to be this transparent. I think we are this transparent in a lot of ways. And I think it's really, really important that we handle this professionally. And so um, I asked in the dev channel, you know, hey, what do you guys think about um, doing this sort of report? And there was no real negative response, which I've learned has probably means it's a positive response. Um, 
but also no one wanted to say, oh, that's a good idea because then they're now doing the report. <laughs> oh. So I said, uh, you know what, no problem. Let me, let me spearhead getting this started. I know exactly kind of what I want to see. And so I just built a Google Doc and shared it with a few people. And, um, you know, big shout out to Andy and all the boys uh, that pump, that jumped in there. Timothy was in there. I mean, every core dev was basically in that document. So although I had started and, and laid out some of it, you know, it was very quickly taken over and or augmented by multiple different people in the team. So I really don't want to take credit for anything other than just sort of getting the ball rolling. That was truly um, an experience that that is is unique to Dash. Is that these people all over the world were able to come together very quickly and come to a resolution and and get out some good content for the uh, for the network. And I think that's important. I think that's something that not only do we need to make sure we continue to do, but it's something that'll give uh, confidence to our investors. It'll give confidence to them to know that hey, if these things happen and we don't know what to do we can feel confident that the core team is actively researching this for us you know Sheplin has just been amazing like the guy i think from the time the ddos hit to the time he had the rules he basically learned the entire ufw stack and how to work it and like like that's insane like some people take years to learn firewalls and this guy puts out a, a set of firewall rules that very comprehensively in five or six hours. Um, and I mean, I wish I was that guy. I wish I, I did it as fast as he did. I wish I were but, Chaplin too. Right. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, people I wish I was sometimes. Yeah. Maybe half. Yeah. I think if we could clone Moo Cow, I, I'd take a clone. Sure. Yeah. Well, I want to wrap up by sort of asking you about your surroundings. I see these sort of fancy, monitors around you um is that like some sweet decoration that you got for today's video which i appreciate or what is that are yeah. you in like your dash office or what is what is it exactly i call this the the network operations center in canada uh and so <laughs> this is the uh dash.news.tv just showing the price of a master node right now what it's worth how much you're getting for it uh, below it here is the listen.masternode.io where I'm always talking about how busy our blockchain is. You know, that screen very recently was empty and people talk about our transactions going up. Yeah, they are. I'm watching them every day and I see them all the time. Uh, below that is the Dash Polynex chart. Uh, above here is Shapelin's awesome, awesome system. So this is how we actually noticed the DDoS or I think this is how he noticed the DDoS. So you can just sort of see the last bit of it right there. That really, oh. really big bump, that was the actual triggering event where, oh, you probably can't see it on the glare. It's pretty bad. Oh, um, no, I, I saw it. I saw it. See that right there? It's just like right there. And so that was the bump where the connections from, you know, a, a normal master node would have like maybe 25 or 50 connections. And all of a sudden, those master nodes were jumping up to like 260 or 270. So. So that is again a Shiplin original. He, I asked him, "Hey man, I really need something for my TV." And so this tells all different things about the network. You know, we're seeing uh, master nodes enabled, how fast the blocks are coming. You know, just just lots of different stuff like that. Uh, and then over here, I like to still keep an eye on the uh, the King Bit Bitcoin because you know we all like to know about Bitcoin, and that's just Canada or sorry, uh, I think it's Bitfinex and Kraken. And then at the very top there, I use that one on the main TV when we're trading. I still do a bunch of trading. And that one's uh, average Dash price, average Bitcoin price across most exchanges uh, in the world. So really, at the end of the day, it's just something that I can use to, um, to keep a visual eye on, on the network, keep a visual cue on what's going on. And, and if I need to react, I can react. I will not rest until I have a room just like that. Well, you know, um, you keep going with these dash detailed videos and all the great content you're putting together and it could very well be something that we create for you. Um, I don't think I've often talked to a lot of people. I don't think you could have too many screens. Like it's like you can't have too many. There's just, it's not possible. And maybe I have a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, you know, maybe I, I like screens too much, but 
I'm, no, I'm going to think on that, on whether you've just stated a truism when you say you can never have too many screens. I'm going to think on that, and I appreciate you giving me that food for thought as we, uh, <laughs> as we finish our interview. I want to say thanks for your time, Coin Gun, a.k.a. Jeff Smith. Well, thank you very much, Amanda. And but, don't forget to hit me up on Twitter, at Coin Gun. Um, love to hear you guys. Love to talk to you guys. And thanks a lot for the interview today.